In the previous discussion, we raised the topic of courage, and the definition we're working with is the quality of mind that enables one to face danger with self-possession, confidence, and resolution. And when we think of danger there, we're not thinking just of physical danger, but psychological danger, personal danger, reputational danger. All of these kinds of dangers call for a kind of courage. We noted that some synonyms for courage are bravery, valor, boldness, heroism. We noted that antonyms, that is words that are the opposite of courage, one would be cowardice, weakness, for example. We looked at some examples. We spoke briefly of these young men going ashore uh, into France on on June 6, 1944, and beginning the process of pushing Nazi Germany out of France and liberating Western Europe from the Nazi regime. Of course, you know, in, in, in one respect, these guys don't have a choice, but they do have a choice about the extent to which they're going to be in the fight. You know, you can get yourself into circumstances where maybe you're a bit safer than others and you can avoid the fight to some degree. And so there certainly is courage here when you're pushing ahead uh, into machine gun fire into a very dangerous circumstance and, and you have a principle in mind and, and that is the principle that Western Europe should be free. Western Europe should not be under the rule of Nazi Germany. There's a kind of courage there. We gave the example of Justin Gallegos who has cerebral palsy and yet is a noted runner, right? And Justin doesn't win the races that he runs because of his disability. But there's a kind of courage here that comes with uh, stepping out on the track and running that race and indicating to the world that although I have a disability, I still love to run. And then he runs a half marathon, and then he runs a, mar a marathon, a full 26-mile marathon and it's inspiring and it's impressive and it takes a kind of courage. In this case I wanted to look at a couple examples from literature of courage. Both examples um, being about young women and one example comes from Hebrew literature that is from the book of Esther. And the background story uh, or part of the story is that there's a, a man in this uh, in this story named Haman. And Haman wants to kill all of the Jews in the part of the world that he's in. Esther has recently become queen and she finds out about this. Now Esther wants to talk to the king and, and wants to, you know, avert this situation because she herself is a Jew. And so she wants to avert the, the killing of all of the Jews in the part of the world that she's in. So she needs to communicate with the king. But there's a rule that, that if anybody goes into a certain place um, without the king's permission, then that person can be executed, right? Unless the king indicates otherwise. And so we move into that part of the story. Esther has been told by Mordecai, another important person in the story, about what Haman is planning. And so Esther sends this reply to Mordecai. She said, Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. So notice that Esther is not at, uh, acting precipitately. She's not uh, acting in a knee-jerk kind of way. She's taking her time. She's being thoughtful about things. She's being deliberate about things. She's not being rash. And this is an important point we mentioned in the last video that Aristotle says, look, courage and rashness are different. Courage and recklessness are different. The person of courage is going to be a person usually of thought and of deliberation. You're not acting precipitately, meaning acting like, you know, knee-jerk reactions. So Ed, that's not what Esther's doing. So three days of fasting. Let's slow down think about this and prepare, spiritually, prepare psychologically. Then Esther says, when this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Well, that's courageous, right? 
how easy it might have been for Esther to say, hey, you know, I've got a really nice job. You know, I'm the queen. I can boss people around. I get a lot of goodies, you know, servants, nice meals, comfortable bed, you know, comfortable furniture, nice house. Uh, you know, just let it go. But that's not what she does. There's a principle at work, and this again goes back to that previous discussion we had, that a person uh, takes a courageous stand because there's some principle at stake. And here the principle I think is pretty clear, that the Jewish people should not be eliminated. I think that's a pretty clear principle that Esther takes a stand on. And if she dies in the process of taking the stand, then that's how it is. Right? If I perish, I perish. And so the story goes, on the third day Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So she's not going to die. Had his reaction been different, then her life would have been lost. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter and the king asked, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given to you. So Esther clearly has lived a pretty impressive life, right? She's, she's made a mark, right? The king is impressed with her. And so not only is her own life spared, but she's able to do things that will save the lives of all of the Jews in that part of the world. And so it's a great story and I encourage you to read it. But the thing to focus on really is that is that that last line there at the bottom of this screen. I will go to the king even though it is against the law. If I perish, I perish. That is a statement of courage. Let's look at another example. This one comes to us from the Greeks from from Sophocles there. And this play is Antigone. And it's interesting because, once again, we have a, a young woman and a king. In this case, it's the future daughter-in-law of the king. She's going to marry the king's son. The story is that there's a battle. The story is that one of the king's sons uh, uh, is a traitor to the state. He betrays the state. And then he's killed. And uh, as retribution for that son's betrayal, the king, whose name is Creon, says that, you know, that traitor, that person who betrayed the state, will not um, be buried. Burial rites will not be performed over his body, right? Which is a big deal, because if burial rites are not performed over that body, then that has all kinds of implications for what comes in the afterlife, okay? Now, Creon does this for a good reason, because betrayal of the state is a big deal. If somebody is a traitor, if somebody betrays the state, that's obviously a big deal. So it's not hard to understand why Creon responds in such a strong way. The body of that traitor will not uh, have burial rites performed over it. But Antigone, she has a different principle. I mean, Creon is acting, I think, in principle, but Creon has, I'm sorry, but Antigone has a different principle, and that is that the gods require burial rites, and there are no exceptions, right? There's, there are no exceptions. It's true that he betrayed the state, but that's not an exception. The gods require burial rites, and so let's see what happens. So, so Antigone then performs the burial rites. She has the burial rites performed over this body. And, and Creon now, he's in a tough spot. And I think, you know, it's important to see things from Creon's point of view. Creon put out this order, the burial rites will not be performed on this body. His future daughter-in-law, Antigone, performs the rites. That puts Creon in a tough position, right? His law, his order, has just been breached, right? And, and everyone knows it. So Creon's in a tough spot. Creon says, do you deny you did this or admit it? Antigone said, I admit I did it. I won't deny that, right? So Antigone said, yeah, I performed the burial rites. I had the burial rites performed over that body. Creon says, tell me briefly, not in some lengthy speech, 
Were you aware there was a proclamation forbidding what you did? Antigone said, I heard of it. How could I not? It was public knowledge. Everyone knew, Creon, that you said this. And so Creon responds, and yet you dared to break those very laws. And Antigone responds, yes. Zeus did not announce those laws to me. So Creon, you have your laws, and Zeus has his laws. And now I, Antigone, I have to choose. I did not think anything which you proclaimed strong enough to let a mortal override the gods and their unwritten and unchanging laws. The gods have laws that are unwritten and unchanging. And one of those laws is that burial rites should be performed over dead bodies. Creon, you put out a law saying that the burial rites would not be performed over that dead body. And so, therefore, I, Antigone, have to choose whose law I will obey. And I choose the eternal, unchanging laws of the gods. Because those laws, they're not just for today or yesterday, but they exist forever. And no one knows where they first appeared. These are unchanging laws. Here we have this concept we've talked about. I, I think this is related to the concept of the Logos that we've talked about before. Sort of these, these principles that are just built into the universe. This seems to be what Antigone is getting at. So I did not mean to let a fear of any human will lead to my punishment among the gods. So I have a choice. I can obey Creon or I can obey the gods. If I obey Creon, then I'm going to have to face accountability in front of the gods. If I obey the gods, I'm going to have to face accountability in front of Creon. So we have a choice. We have a choice. I know all too well I'm going to die. How could I not? It makes no difference what you decree. Right? So this is kind of interesting. Antigone seems to be saying that last, but you know what? I'm going to die eventually anyway. If I die now because I have, you know, broken your law, that's how it is, right? I'm going to die eventually anyway. And I'm going to have to stand in front of the gods, and I'm going to have to account for what I did with their unchanging laws. So we have a, a, a case here where Creon has a point of view. He has a principle, right, that the integrity of the state requires that we take very strong measures against traitors, against those who betray the state. Antigone also has a principle that the laws of the gods must be adhered to. I think there's room for compromise here, right? You can make a strong statement against a traitor without negating the laws of the gods. So in this case, my own view, you know, I say that Creon's argument is, uh, is not as persuasive. All right. But notice the similarity. Esther says, if I perish, I perish. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this courageous stand. Now she ends up surviving, she ends up living, and saves, you know, many, many thousands of Jews in her part of the world at the, at the same time. Antigone takes that same stand. I realize I'm putting my own life at risk, but I'm going to take this stand. And in her case, she does die. I wanted to pass by you an example. Whenever I think of Esther, whenever I think of, of Antigone, there's a, a modern person I think of, Maria Corina Machado. And you can easily look this up. If you look up, just Google Maria Corina Machado, and then look up the name Hugo Chavez, H-U-G-O Chavez, C-H-A-V-E-Z. And it's a remarkable moment because Hugo Chavez, a dictator, had destroyed Venezuela when this incident that's depicted in this photo in the bottom, when this happens, Hugo Chavez is in, is in the process of destroying Venezuela. Venezuela could be a rich and prosperous country. All right. but, but Hugo Chavez, because of his policies, because of his decisions, because of his authoritarianism, he destroys Venezuela. And a certain day in I think it would be the Congress of Venezuela. Maria Machado, who is a, I'm not sure what the right word is, a deputy, a legislator, she stands up and challenges Hugo Chavez. It's something really to see. 
And you know, if we don't understand Spanish, we're at a bit of a disadvantage here. But even if you turn the volume down and you just look at what happens, you can see that, that Maria Machal is surrounded by Hugo Chavez's, uh, the only word that comes to my mind is his goons, right? When Maria Machado stands up and challenges this dictator, she, when she challenges this man who is in the process of destroying the country of Venezuela, not only is she challenging the, the most powerful man in Venezuela, but she is surrounded by his goons, surrounded by his jackals. You can see in the photo the people around her laughing at her, scorning her. I encourage you to look look this up. Look up look this look up this uh, this powerful moment when this woman stands up in the legislature of Venezuela and challenges Hugo Chavez. It always sends a chill up my spine. It is a, a moment of tremendous courage. It's just an illustration of what courage looks like as she stands up and takes on this dictator. It's very much worth the time. We think about Esther, we think about Antigone, we think about Maria Machado, and these are women in, 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 in lofty positions, right? Esther is a queen, Antigone is a future uh, daughter-in-law of a king, Maria Machado is a, a legislator in Venezuela. But most acts of courage don't take place in those realms because there aren't very many people who have those kinds of positions. Most acts of courage take place in everyday life. Right? So I wanted to pass by to you another, or pass by you another example that I remember of courage in sort of an ordinary event. And this is the case of Charles Grandy. And Charles Grandy was a teacher of mine. And the teachers at the school I was going to were talking about going on strike. And so they're all going around wearing pins kind of like the one we see there. And all the pins said, can we talk, right? And, and, and the message was pitched to, you know, the administrators. And so can we talk to resolve our problems? Otherwise, we're going to go on strike. All the teachers were wearing these pins except for Mr. Grandy. And so as soon as we got into Mr. Grandy's class, everyone immediately noticed that he was not wearing the pin. And so someone, I think it was a, a, a young woman, she raised her hand and asked Mr. Grandy, why aren't you wearing a pin? And he very, just sort of curtly responded, that's not why I'm here. And then he moved on. And everybody understood what Mr. Grandy meant. Mr. Grandy had a principle and his, his, he had a commitment. He had an ideal. His commitment was to education. And Mr. Grandy did not want to be sidetracked from the cause of education. He did not want to get pulled into these political fights. He just wanted to teach, and he wanted to challenge his students, right? So he's not going to let himself get distracted. And it was a courageous stand, not because his life was threatened, but because I know, because I heard, other teachers criticizing him for not wearing a pin. Well, who does Mr. Grandy think he is, you know, not wearing a pin? And he was misinterpreted. He was, uh, people said, well, he's arrogant, or, you know, something like that. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, there was a risk because other people were upset with him for not going along, not wearing the pin. But he had a principle. He had a principle that my job is to teach. And every day that's what I'm going to get up and do. And I'm not going to be sidetracked by this stuff. Right? I'm not going to be sidetracked by this stuff. In this, Mr. Granny wants to get along with people. Right? He's willing to make some compromises but he's not going to compromise what for him is a core principle. Now other teachers had different points of view and that's how life is. But Mr. Grandy had his principle. He stood on it. And I found it at the time absolutely impressive. I mean, I think I liked Mr. Grandy before, but my esteem for him rose dramatically because I realized he was doing something courageous because he was upsetting a lot of, a lot of people. Not because he wanted to upset them. He didn't want to upset people. But neither did he want to indicate that he went along with something that was distracting from the cause of education, which is what he was all about. 
So that's a, that's, that was an act of courage that I saw just in the ordinary course of life. But it, 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 it made a real mark. Uh, I found that very impressive. And here I am, I mean, what, almost four decades later, talking about it. So one of the things that's important to think about is that people, you know, aren't born courageous. No one ever looks at, at a six-month-old and says, wow, I mean, what a courageous baby. You know, no one ever says that. No one ever looks at a toddler, at a three-year-old toddler, and, and says in any serious way, wow, what a, what a courageous three-year-old. I mean, you know, you can imagine contexts where people would say that kind of thing. But not in the sense of, you know, like I was just talking about Mr. Grandy or, or Maria Machado or Antigone or Esther when we're talking about the courage that they display. Obviously, three-year-olds can't do that, right? So people aren't born courageous, they become courageous. And how does a person become courageous? You become courageous by practicing, right? This is a point that Aristotle makes, that people become good builders by building. How do you become a good house builder? You practice house building. People become instrumentalists by playing instruments. How do you become a good piano player? You practice. How do you become a good violin player? You practice. Similarly, Aristotle says, we become just by performing just acts. We become truthful by practicing truthfulness. We become disciplined by practicing discipline. And we become courageous by practicing courage in the ordinary stuff of life so that when the big decision comes, then we're ready. So it's really hard to believe that Antigone had never done anything courageous before, that she'd never done anything principled before, that all of a sudden, she all of a sudden became this person of great courage. Hard to believe Esther just all of a sudden became a courageous person, right? Hard to believe that Maria Machado just all of a sudden, just out of the blue, became a person of courage. Hard to believe that Mr. Granny just all of a sudden became the kind of person who did what he did. Obviously not huge, right? But still a lift a mark. Here we are talking about it decades later. No, no, no. These people became the kind of people they were because of practice in life. This is very important, a very important idea from Aristotle, the importance of practice. The importance of avoiding the idea of thinking, well, you know, I don't have to worry about doing good work now. You know, I'll do good enough. I'll do good enough. But when it's really important, then I'll do a really good job. That's dangerous. No, that's dangerous. Because we want to practice doing as well as we can so that when that really important project comes, we've got a lot of practice behind us. Same thing with courage. We become courageous people by practicing. And so courage is that quality of mind that enables a person to face some kind of danger with self-possession, confidence, and resolution. You notice, by the way, when I talk about Mr. Grandy, I said that he just, the person said, why aren't you wearing a pin? And Mr. Grandy just very curtly said, that's not why I'm here drop the topic. He didn't give us a lecture. He didn't give us a speech. Just drop the topic and move on to whatever we're supposed to do today. That was a kind of self-possession and a kind of confidence and a kind of resolution. There was no question. We knew where Mr. Grandy was coming from and we knew why. It was so clear, right? Even though he gave us just one little sentence. So that, strike, that sticks out in my mind as an example of courage. So here are some questions for you. In the ordinary course of life, have you ever seen someone act courageously? So we have examples from literature, Antigone, Esther, we could think of others. We have examples from, you know, sort of world affairs, world affairs, Maria Machado, I gave you that example. But in my own life, I mean, that, 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 that example of Mr. Grandy, that really sticks out. How about for you? Have, how about for you? Have you ever seen anybody act in a courageous way? Why are courageous people important? Why is it important to have people like this about whom we can speak, about the courageous things they did? What does a society lose if it lacks a critical mass of courageous people? Critical mass just meaning enough to get something done, right? Um, I, I don't think we can have a society of 330 million people where every single person is courageous. Just given the human reality, I don't think that's possible. But for a society of 330 million people to function well, we do need a certain critical mass of courageous people. That is, we need enough courageous people 
so that the society has enough of a well of courage within it, if that makes sense. What happens to a society if society doesn't have courageous people? We can think of examples. I mean, you know, an extreme example would be Nazi Germany in the 1930s. Were there some courageous people who stood against the regime? Yes, not very many though, not very many. No, it's a shockingly small number of people. So there have been such examples of societies where there just wasn't a whole lot of courage to go around. What happens to a society if we don't have a critical mass of courageous people? So these are really good questions, and I think you know, a question that we could pose to ourselves is, do I want to be a courageous person? Do I want to be that kind of person who, when the moment comes, I will be able to stand? Right? Well, if the answer to that question is yes, then I'd better start practicing. I'd better start working on becoming that kind of person.